began to look more and more. Uh, the videos just kept getting bigger and bigger and, and more intense, and he shared his testimony on there. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I never expected that he would return my call, but I called him, and he called me right back. And it just went from there. And we actually had this scheduled in March of, of last year, or this year, but uh, due to the, the pandemic situation, we chose to uh, put that off until now. And we know that today is probably not the best day to schedule something, but it was the only day that we could schedule it. So we scheduled it accordingly. And uh, I want to share with you a little bit about Billy. He is our guest speaker tonight. Uh, he is also a big game guide hunter. He uh, has, has guided big game hunts in Alaska for the past 24 years. And uh, during that time, all of the time totals that he has actually lived in a tent for eight full years during that time. And when I say a tent, uh, you really need to go and look at a video and you'll understand what I mean. There's no running water. Uh, there's no amenities whatsoever. He's flown in in a plane. He's dropped off. And uh, there are a lot of wild quitters out there that like to eat people. And so it's a little different from what we're used to. We don't have a uh, issue with bear attacking you, but they do out there, and they have to be prepared for that. He is also an author, and out in the foyer he has books out there, and uh, we, you're welcome to, to purchase those, and he has videos out there as well. He is a filmmaker and uh, of the award-winning Modern Day Mountain Man, and uh, that's a video series that he uh, has a, a, a channel on, and so look that up. If you want to just go online and type in Modern Day Mountain Man, or you can type in Billy Moles, and either way, it'll come up and you will see that. And uh, he is with us today, and I'm thankful of that. He flew in this afternoon, and he'll be flying back tomorrow. And I appreciate him taking time out of his schedule and away from his family to come and be with us tonight. And I think that you will be blessed uh, by the testimony that he shares. So uh, also at the end, we will give away two grand prizes, and at that time, we'll, we'll just give instructions from there. But thank you once again. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to have Billy come and uh, share with us accordingly. So uh, please pray with me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this afternoon. And as we gather, we pray that your spirit will lead us, that you will guide us, that you will anoint every word that comes forth from, from Billy, from his mouth and his heart, and that it will be impactful to each of us that are here. Thank you for the ones that are here. I know that this is not the crowd we hope for, but nevertheless, it is the crowd that you sent, and we will accept that. And tonight I pray that you receive the glory and honor for this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Billy, you come whenever you're ready. to be surrounded by nothing and but will just to be surrounded by nothing and but wilderness and wildlife. That's why I do it. Can you hear me all right in the back? Excellent. Very good. My first story tonight comes from Kodiak Island. Of course, Kodiak Island is very well known for its huge brown bears. Now on this hunt, this hunter was looking for a 10-foot brown bear. He wanted, he wanted a king-size brown bear. Now this hunter's wife would accompany him on his hunts. She didn't hunt, but she just liked being in nature. She liked taking pictures. She just liked to come along. Now the hunter's mother-in-law 
she had an affinity for bears. And so when she found out they were going to Kodiak Island, she said, well, boy, I'd sure like to come along. Well, the hunter realized, well, gosh, this is a lose-lose situation. Do I tell my mother-in-law that she can't come and suffer the wrath from her and my wife for the rest of my life, or do I spend the next 15 days in a hunting camp in close proximity with my mother-in-law? Like most hunters, this one was a very wise man, and he realized that a happy wife is a happy life. So he tells the, mo tells the mother-in-law, come on along. So they, go to, they land in Kodiak. The next day, they get a float plane, and they land in a lake like you see here, and they set up their camp. And they get everything all cozied in, and uh, they have a good supper, get their gear ready. The next morning, it's a rare bluebird day on Kodiak Island. The hunter's snoring in his cot, and all of a sudden, his wife grabs him and shakes him. Get up, get up, get up. I can't find mom. I've been searching all morning. I can't find her anywhere. The hunter says, relax, relax. She's around here somewhere. She's off taking pictures, going potty. We'll find her. So they start looking around camp. They can't find the mother-in-law. They start doing a grid search and doing circles all around camp. They still can't find her. Finally, they're way back by the mountain behind camp. And the, and the wife looks up, up at the mountain. She says, oh, thank goodness, there she is. Well, just then, she starts to back up. She backs up to this huge rock cliff. And all of a sudden, a huge Kodiak brown bear emerges out of the brush, coming right for her. And the wife just screams. She's terrified. And she says, what are we going to do? And the hunter just looks up and says, I ain't doing a dang thing. That bear got himself into this mess. Now he can get himself out of it. I learned real quick when I got into the, uh, the guiding world that uh, in order to be a guide, you had to be a good storyteller. So you learn pretty quick. So this is the farm where I was born, or where I was raised, I should say. I wasn't born in a farm. That'd be, that'd be pretty Jesus-like to be uh, born in a manger there. But um, my grandpa was also raised in this farm. My dad was raised in this farm. Now my grandpa, in addition to being a Maybe we'll just get that over with because it's going to go down there anyways. In addition to being a farmer, he was also a professional trapper. So after the fall harvest, he would go deer hunting, shoot a bunch of deer, hopefully, and butcher them because he had seven kids. And then he would go up into the north woods of Wisconsin. And during that deer season, he would build a log cabin. And then after he got home, butchered all the deer, he would go back to that log cabin and he would trap all winter long. And so he would be up there for five to six months out of the winter. When the spring thaw would come, he would come home, sell his furs, and he'd use that money to buy seeds, start a new farming season all over again. And so my grandpa was kind of a um, uh, pretty, I don't, I don't know what you, what you call him. He's kind of a man ahead of his time, and he would take a lot of photos. He even took some video. And those photos always really intrigued me. His lifestyle was always very attractive to me. And he started taking me uh, trapping with him when I was real young. And I was always amazed by how he could hear a bird. And it was just, he wouldn't even think about it. Just the words would come out of his mouth. He'd name what the bird was. He'd see a track and he could tell me exactly what it was. And he could even tell what the animals were doing, even though they weren't there. And then when he'd placed that trap, he would set it. He'd say, you see that, that muskrat, that raccoon, that beaver, that mink, it's going to step right here. How did he know that? He, he knew something I didn't know. He could see something that I couldn't see. And I was just enthralled by that. And I think more than anything, why I loved, loved the wilderness is my dad was never telling me to milk cows. He was never telling, nobody was telling me what to do. And I was free. I was free to be me. And just nature... It, it, I've, ever since my mom said, I, so since I, she remembers me as a kid with mud boots on and I was always outside. I've loved it since I was a kid. And then my dad took me muskrat trapping and that was just, that was a pivotal moment in my life. It, it was a Saturday, we milked the cows, we, we load a, a, an or, a small rowboat, a bunch of traps, a bunch of alder stakes, and I couldn't believe my dad was going to help me start my own muskrat line on Lightning Creek. So he was going to help me get the trap set, and then I had to check it and take care of it from there. And so when we oared away from the bridge, and I lost sight of the road, sight of the power line, and sight of Henry Hines's farm, and I looked around me, and there was no evidence of man, and I was surrounded by nature, it was like a light switch moment in me. It just something clicked, 
and I realized this is how I want to live my life. So the fur market fell out. I realized I couldn't survive as a, as a professional trapper, and I started hunting, and I really enjoyed that, started reading magazines, and I came across Alaska. And I started reading a little bit about that, asking my grandpa about it, and we were down in his basement. He didn't even, I mean, he was so hardcore, he skinned his animals in the basement. He didn't even go out to the garage or a shed or anything. It was in the basement of the house. And he said, Billy, he said, if you want outdoor adventure, Alaska, that's the place where you need to go. He said, there's a place where man's never been, animals that have never seen human. And so I knew that was, that's where I wanted to go. Back of an Outdoor Life magazine, I saw this ad for Big Game Guides Needed is what it said. And it was a guide school in Montana. So I signed up for that. I didn't know how else to get started. And uh, graduated high school. And it was, came time for me to go to this guide school. And so I asked my mom, this is my mom and my dad, I asked my mom, I said, you know, should I chase this crazy dream? Or should I go to college? Should I get a job? Should I stay here on the farm? And my mom gave me some of the greatest advice anyone's ever given me. She said, Billy, this is your dream. And if you don't do it now, you never will. The hardest part of, I think that's like a Chinese proverb or something, the, the hardest, the, the toughest, what is it? The hardest part of a journey of a thousand miles is the first step. The hardest part of all of this was just making it to Clayton, Wisconsin. I had tears in my eyes before I got to Clayton. I'd been maybe about 200 miles from my house my whole entire life and I was driving out to western uh, Montana. I mean, I was scared. And, uh, but I made it. I didn't stop. And I think that's, that's pretty much, that's about 90% of it is just anything in life is just not stopping. So I go to this guide school. It was a month-long course, primarily geared towards Western hunting. What they taught me was how to work with horses and mules. And so my first job in the guiding industry was in Idaho. I was a packer. So we were hunting uh, mule deer, elk, and bighorn sheep. So my job was to lead uh, strings of mules and horses, sometimes as far as 30 miles into the wilderness. And then I would shadow the guides, help them, try to learn a little bit. And as the hunters were successful, it was my job to pack all those animals out of the wilderness. And so I got, uh, I got really close. And my best friend when I was in Idaho was Earl. Earl was this old, trusty mule that could go anywhere. It didn't matter where these animals died. A lot of the mules, they'd get scared, they'd balk, they'd stop, but Earl would go anywhere. And so he and I got pretty close during those few months. So the, uh, that winter, I went home, or I went home after the fall season, and then that winter, I wrote, called, emailed every outfitter I could find in Alaska, told them I was a farm kid, greener than grass, didn't know anything about hunting in Alaska, but I wanted to be a guide, and I was willing to do whatever it took. So I got hired on as a packer in Alaska as well. Big difference between a packer in Idaho and a packer in Alaska. In Alaska, I was the mule. It was my job to backpack all the camping supplies into the mountains, and as the hunters were successful, to pack all the meat, cape, and antlers out of the field as well. So after two years of doing that, I was able to get a guide's license, and uh, been doing it ever since, 24 years now. It just seems like yesterday I was doing this. This was the very first hunt I was ever on in Kodiak. It might not look it, but that pack probably weighs about 160 pounds. I had to pack that thing out 13 miles. I made it about nine, nine, maybe, maybe 10 of the miles all the way out, and I just couldn't physically do it. But that's why I go to a chiropractor once, uh, once a week. Is right, you're looking at it right there. It's very, very labor intensive. So I'm guiding for, um, Oh, yep, and so ever since I started, um, that first hunt that I was on, this guy, it's just amazing how things work out in life. Um, I always had like a dream of, of making hunting videos if I couldn't become a guide. And uh, the first client I was ever packing for, he had a video camera. He filmed his hunt, and then when he came time to shoot the bear, he handed me his video camera. He said, hey, would you mind filming this bear, you know, if we shoot it? Absolutely. So he shoots this great big bear, and then when he got home, he made copies of it, and he sent, sent one to my parents. And then my parents kind of farmed it. This is old VHS tapes. My parents kind of farmed it all around town, and when I came home like six, seven months later, I'd run into people, hey, I saw that video that, of that hunt you were on in Kodiak Island. Oh, man, that was amazing the way you guys backpacked in there and the airplanes and what you ate and all that thing. They, they, didn't, they usually didn't talk about 
the bear, shooting the bear, which at that time, in my mind, that was the most important part, you know? And so I started, I bought my own video camera and I started filming my hunt so that I could bring it home and show my grandpa. And then over periods of time, I had all this hunt, this, this footage cataloged, and then eventually I just put a video together and, and just kind of one thing led to another. And uh, so it's just kind of amazing, just these small, seemingly insignificant things, it's amazing, you know, what, what they can lead to and those people that you cross paths with. And so I'm currently guiding for brown bear, grizzly bear, doll sheep, caribou, uh, and occasionally we'll shoot uh, wolves. So here, a lot of areas like this one where we're hunting, um, I don't even need a uh, tag because there's so many of them. They try to shoot as many as they can because the fur market has, has gone way down, so there's just no economic feasibility for people to trap wolves anymore. So you're out in the middle of the wilderness, and obviously the ideal of, of conservation is, let's say, for example, you have a fire move through an area in Alaska, and then all of a sudden, about two years later, you have got epic moose habitat, and the moose population skyrockets. Well, as you have a lot of moose, what happens to the population of the predators? It rises as well. Uh, about 10 years later, now all those popple trees and seedlings that were this tall, they're all about 10 to 20 feet tall, and now there's no food for the moose. Well, what happens to the moose population? It falls off. Well, now you've got all these wolves and bears with nothing to eat, and then that crashes, and then you get this yo-yo effect with these population levels. So the idea of conservation is you want to keep the moose at a sustainable level so they don't get too high, and then the wolves, the predators, they don't get too high as well. So you want to try to keep the population level more, more hills and valleys rather than mountain peaks and gorges below. But in this area, we were, uh, we were moose hunting and bear hunting, and my hunters, it was towards evening, and the hunters were a couple of brothers, and they're like, ah, we're going to go back to camp. Camp was only about 300 yards away, and it's a beautiful night, and I thought, ah, I'll just stay out here till dark, see what we see. And I look up on this ridge top and I see a bunch of silhouettes. And I think, man, what's weird about a mile and a half, maybe two miles away? And I thought they were a herd of caribou, but there's not many caribou in that area. So I put my binoculars up and I'm like, holy smokes, it's a pack of wolves, 14 of them. And they start kind of trotting their way down this open ridge, kind of towards our camp, but they're not coming right at us. And it's just about dark. So I go back to camp and told my hunters, hey, check this out. There's a pack of wolves out there. My hunter says, you think they'll be around in the morning? I said, ah, I, I kind of doubt it. We wake up in the morning, I glass where they, where they last were, and I don't see them. We're getting our stuff ready, and, and I glass, it's a little bit lighter, and I'm like, they're right there. They, they're bedded right there, all 14 of them. And so I try to howl. I'll try to give a good wolf howl. But it was windy, and they couldn't hear it. So we were moose hunting, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to try a cow call, try to sound like a cow moose. And so I did this. Well, that vibratory tone, they heard that. All 14 of those wolves started howling, and they gathered together. They congregated in an area about the size of this stage. And my hunter's like, well, that got their attention. I'm like, yeah, you guys better get your stuff ready, you know, just in case they come in. And so we're about packed up. And I'm like, you guys good? They're like, yeah. And so I just gave one more call. And they never made a peep, but all of a sudden, bam, they just started coming. And what's interesting, you watch predators. I think you learn more from predators than anything else. So as they're coming in, they're single file. You've got one wolf. The alpha's in the front. What are all the other, if you're, when I do some corporate speaking, I always use this story. What are all those, those 13 wolves trailing behind? What are they paying attention to? The leader, nobody else. And as they get closer, as they're coming in, that's what you're seeing here. As they're getting closer, my one hunter, he's like shaking. I mean, he's really nervous. He's like, how far? I'm like, they came from a mile and a half. And I'm like, oh, they're 400, you know, 300. Eventually, they're 200. And at that point, the hunters know that you're just going to hold right on them. So distance doesn't matter. I'm just like, don't shoot till I tell you to. Wait for them to stop. And my hunter's just shaking. The one, the one is calm and cool, and the other one's shaking. And he says, I feel like I'm in a dog food commercial <laughs> as these wolves are coming right towards us. And... <clears throat> So right about here, you can kind of see they're going to go behind this dip. They're about 100 yards away there, and they're going to go behind this dip. And so I'm worried that they're going to, like, come right up to us and, like, run right past us. So, 
Uh, what does a coyote hunter do when you want to get a coyote to stop? Do we have any coyote hunters here? Yep, yep, you make some noise to get them to stop. So I start going, whoop, 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 and they still won't stop. Well, they come down in that dip, and then they appear, and they're 40 yards away. And now they're going to run right past us. So I just started, yip, 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 really, really loud, and they froze. And at this point, I realize there's all these wolves, and there's no limit to the number we can shoot. I'm going to be skinning wolves for days. You know, my back hurt just thinking about it. And so once the guns started going off, then the wolves scattered. Long story short, we only shot two of them. But, um, but it was pretty exciting, and the, and the footage of it is pretty phenomenal. And so I'm also guiding, as I mentioned earlier, for moose. And so God's timing is perfect. And if I've learned anything of my time in the wilderness, is that everything in nature has a purpose, and everything happens for a reason. That's why I do what I do, is trying to connect those pieces of the puzzle. And so we're hunting moose. I'm kind of running two computers at once, and I'm not a very good, that's a woman thing. Multitasking is a woman thing. I'm not very good at it. And so we're hunting moose in September when they're, when they're rutting. And what's amazing about these antlers, so a moose's antlers, we don't have any moose up here. So a moose will grow his antlers in about five months' time, and they can be 80 pounds, over 70 inches wide on a big one. And so they'll have velvet on them just like a white-tailed deer. At the end of August, 1st of September, they'll, they'll rub that velvet off, and those antlers will become hard, you know, hard-horned. So how does a bull and a moose, how do they find one another to breed? In some areas of Alaska, you'll have less than one moose per 30 square miles. So you'll have 60 square miles, one bull, one cow. How do they find one another when it's time to breed? They'll do it through vocalization. So the cow, as she comes into estrus, will make a sound like I gave earlier. It's very vibratory in tone. And so what I'm doing is I'm mimicking the sound of a cow moose, and I'm doing it right at sunrise. Why am I doing it right at sunrise? Because as the sun comes up, heats the Earth's atmosphere, it creates thermal winds, and then the sound isn't going to carry as well as it does first thing in the morning. So 90% of my calling is done first thing in the morning. And so that sound, you'll hear it echoing off the mountains, and all of a sudden you'll look over on a hill, it'll be four or five, up to five miles away, and you see two white dots. And what that is, is that bull moose has heard you, and he, just like a, saddle, uh, a cell phone tower, he'll ping you. And he knows exactly where you're at. He's looking right at you, and his antlers are facing you. The reason being, those antlers are God's satellite dish. It's like a parabola if you're a geometry nerd. And so that sound comes in, and it hits the, the moose's hard antlers that just two weeks earlier were covered in velvet and not reflective. That sound comes in, hits his antlers, and it bounces right to his 12-inch ears. Everything in nature is connected. Everything has a purpose. And so if you want to be successful in hunting, trapping, particularly fishing, you've got to figure those things out. So this is kind of the, this one's about 67 inches across. You see the waves and the palms in the back. That's a big, old, mature bull. Bull moose will live to be 20 years old. So this is one back strap of a moose. So from about the, the point of the hip to about the top of the shoulder, so it'll weigh about 30 pounds. And so one hind quarter of a moose from the hock to the hip ball can weigh as much as 80, or 180 pounds. And so we're packing that out on our backs. Again, that's why I go to a chiropractor. This is the best time in a moose hunt. In Alaska, there's a wanton waste law. If I'm sitting there in camp with my hunter and we've got a campfire and there's a set of moose antlers there and no meat, we, could both be, we would both be subject to a $10,000 fine and up to a year in prison because the fish cop is going to assume that we are back at camp waiting for a plane to take us out to town and we're going to leave that meat behind. So you have to have all the meat packed out before you ever bring the antlers out. So, same thing goes with the airplane. All the meat has to be flown out before the antlers fly out. So for me as a guide, this is the happiest, happiest day. This is the greatest part of the moose hunt because the work is done. I once shot a moose three miles from camp and spent three days packing that thing out, and I will never do that again. That is, that is one mistake that you don't repeat. So here we are. Let me get this to run. 
We're in south, uh, where are we? We're about right in here, this part of Alaska. It's some of the best moose country um, that, that there is. So I was guiding a father and his 17-year-old daughter. And here, so his, his name is Mitch, and his daughter's name is Maddie. And so with us on this hunt is a, a guy named John Anderson. And like most uh, guides in Alaska, John's kind of a colorful character. He's about my age. And uh, when John was eight years old, grew up in Illinois, uh, his hair started falling out. And he discovered he had alopecia. And back when, when I was like in school, like bullying was just kind of like part of life. You know, I mean, every, it was kind of like a food chain, you know. It seemed like everybody kind of got bullied, some worse than others, I suppose. But John got bullied because he didn't have any hair. Well, John's method of dealing with bullies, what he found to be most effective, the best way to stop a bully, was to beat his mouth shut. He, he, he kind of found that they didn't, they didn't pick on him so much if uh, they couldn't talk. John said he was in over 40 fist fights before he graduated from high school, the third high school that he went to because he kept getting kicked out of schools because he was fighting all the time. So John's a pretty rough and tumble dude. And uh, he's, a, he's a commercial fisherman, a crabber. If you ever watch Deadliest Catch, that's also what he does. So he's a, he's a rough and tumble guy. Now, I'd guided Mitch before, and so John said, hey, there can only be, there can only be one chief here. You know, he said, so, you know, you've guided Mitch before, so anything I can do to help, you tell me, and I'll do it. And I said, all right, very good. And so first day out, uh, Maddie shot a, I think it was a 66-inch bull. We spent the rest of that day and the next day packing it out. And then after that, um, we were just sitting there glassing, and then over the top of this hill comes this bear. And it looked like a pretty good grizzly bear. Now, Maddie's in high school still, and so Mitch, Mitch was a bow hunter, and he wanted to shoot a 70-inch moose, which is no small order or task. And so we were kind of hoping to get, if Maddie got tagged out, she would fly home and go back to school. And I thought, well, this is a pretty good bear. You know, you want to see if Maddie can get on it. And, and we decided that that's what we were going to do. So John stays back. John stays back to give me hand signals as we move down through the brush and try to stalk this bear because a lot of times what happens, you get down into the bottom and you can't see anything. A guy can hand signal for you to tell you where, which way the bear is moving. And so we get in, and, and the bear really doesn't move much. We get right into position, and we're right up here. Or actually, we're right about here, and the bear is over here, about 100 yards away. And any time you get more people involved, everything gets more complicated. But Mitch was going to back Mac, Maddie up. Maddie was going to shoot the bear, and I was going to film it. So we had a pretty good plan. Everything was working really good. The bear was pretty close. And Maddie's set up, and Mitch kind of throws his pack up into the air. And the bear saw that movement. Now... These bears, they're, they're not very flighty, you know, they, they don't see predators very often, or they don't really have any predators, really. And so the bear was just more curious than anything, but it saw us. And so Mitch was set up, Maddie was set up, the bear's just kind of looking at us. And he was, the bear was quartering toward, and I told Maddie, like, if you've got a good shot, shoot it right, right in the chest. And boom, she shoots, and I heard a report, and the bear turned and ran. But I could tell right away, I'd been doing this long enough, that I could tell by the way the bear was moving that it wasn't a very good hit. And so I told Mitch to shoot. Meanwhile, Maddie short strokes her bolt, which means she doesn't pull the bolt or her, um, the mechanism of the rifle back far enough so it spits out the old round, but not quite far enough to put a fresh round in, and so it gets caught in there. And, and so basically her rifle doesn't work. And so I'm filming, and I'm telling Mitch to shoot, and Mitch is shooting, but Mitch isn't hitting anything but air. And kind of those, like, like anything in life, when you think you've got it in the bag, that's when things go wrong. I didn't even load my rifle. So my rifle's laying there, so I throw my video camera down, I grab my 375, I load around, I turn my scope from one to four power, and I, I had my scope caps on and everything. I throw my scope caps off and I step away from the hunters because that's happened before where guides of people kill one another in the excitement. 
And so I step away and I have no rest and the bear's running away and my rifle is everywhere but on the bear and finally it's about 200 yards away, just about to disappear into the brush and I just settle my scope down, boom, I touch one off and whack, I hit the bear right in the back end and it rolls, hits the ground, rolls into the brush, it's gone. Ooh, yeah, I know I hit the bear. I know Maddie hit the bear. I know Mitch didn't hit the bear. And, and so I'm like, okay, well, we got two slugs into this bear. And so I'm like, all right, you guys wait here. So I go down to the brush and I start looking and I can see where the, the grass is bent over in the tundra, but I'm not seeing any blood. So I go into the brush and this is like September. So the fall foliage is still, 100% of the foliage still on the, on the alders. And these alders and willows, they, I don't know, you guys probably have, do you have any alder here? It grows sideways. And so the bush will be about this tall, but, well, and this, this, these are probably about six, six to seven, eight feet tall, but the limbs will be like up to 20 feet long. They grow sideways, and so then they intermingle, so that way that they can survive the high winds in that country, because the wind can blow like 80 miles an hour. And so we're in there, and it's just a jungle, or I'm in there, and I'm not finding any blood, and I go in about five, maybe ten feet, and I can maybe see my hand in most of it. And when I get in there, and I can see where the bear is going, and I can't find any blood, and all of a sudden I can smell bear. I take a few more steps, and I can smell bear. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe the thing's just laying right in here. And I go about maybe 30, 40 feet into the bush. I can smell bear, but I can't find anything. And so then I back up. I look up on the hill, and there's John looking down at the hill through his binoculars, and I felt so pathetic, but man, I didn't want to do it alone. So I gave the old wave for Johnny Boy to come help me. And so John grabs his stuff, and he starts trucking down the mountain. So I go back to Mitch and Maddie, pull out my video camera, and so I watch the footage to see where Maddie had hit the bear. Maddie hit the bear right in the paw. And so I knew my shot was in the back end. You don't have to be an expert bear hunter to know that a paw shot and a butt shot are not ideal for a grizzly bear. And so at this point, we pretty much know the bear is probably not dead. So John's coming up the hill, Mitch and Maddie are eating and drinking, talking about things, and I go over to this little creek to get some water, but really I just wanted to, to talk to John. And John, because he's bald, he has nothing to absorb the sweat, so the sweat's just pouring out of him, and he sweats like a butcher anyways. And so he comes up, you know, and I'm just kind of waiting for John, and as he gets closer, I notice that he's smiling, and I'm like, Gosh, what's so funny, you know? And he gets a little closer, and he's like, you ever wonder why you didn't stay in school? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. And he's like, man, he's like, gosh, why, why are we still doing this? I'm like, I don't know. And uh, he gets up to me, and he's like, well, well, how do you want to handle it? I said, well, I figure we'll leave Maddie back, a 17-year-old girl has no, no business going in the brush after a wounded grizzly bear. And I said, I figure you and I will go in there, we'll our rifles will be hot, which means loaded. So when we're going through these hunting trips, like there's never a, lo a, a, a round in the chamber. The magazine will be full, but the chambers are always empty, even in bear country, because I'm more worried about the guys I'm with killing me than I am a grizzly bear. And so I said, we'll go in loaded in this situation because obviously things can happen fast. And I said, I think we'll just bring Mitch and let him just mark last blood. I said, I'll take the blood trail. You guard my flank and, you know, Take care of business. And John says, yep, sounds good. Only problem is, I'm taking the blood, you can guard my flank. And I'm like, no, John, this is, this is my mess, I'm taking the blood trail. And so what we're talking about, the guy who's taking the blood trail, he's got probably, he's got the most dangerous job for sure, because he's gonna be doing this at time, going through the brush, trying to find blood, trying to find where the bear went. So the guy behind him, he's got maybe probably the most important job. His job is to kill the bear before it kills him, because that's who the bear is going to go to kill first, the guy in, in the front. And, and that's, that, that's, that's a pretty tough spot to be in, really, but that's the most dangerous job there is. And I said, no, John, I'm taking the blood trail. This is my mess. You know, I'm taking the blood trail. And so John kind of like, kind of steps up and kind of bows his back a little bit, and like, you know, and I said, John, this, this is my deal. And he said, Billy, I'm taking the blood trail. He's like, you got a wife and, kid, wife and kids at home. He said, if I die today, nobody's really going to miss me. He said, I couldn't, and I, but I told him, I couldn't stand the thought of living with the thought that some, if something happened to you, that it was because of me. 
And he said, I couldn't stand the thought, if anything happened to you, he goes, I couldn't stand the thought of your wife and kids not having you because of something I didn't do. And as we're kind of arguing back and forth, I came to realize, man, John's been in over 40 fist fights in his life. All right, John, we're going to do it your way. And so we go off into the bush, we get into the, into the alders, and uh, John's got his pack on, and he, and he had his white shirt on. He always wears white shirts anyways because he's too cheap to buy a decent shirt, I think. But he's got his pack frame on just in case a bear gets on top of him to, to protect himself from the bear of, of ripping him open. And so we get in there. We do start to find some blood. And, and it's getting thicker and thicker as we go. And so at one point, we, we bump this bear. It gets up, starts coming at us. We can, or actually, John saw it first. He's like, he goes, I got a bear. And he just puts his rifle up, and I come right alongside of him, and I didn't even see it, but just as I move alongside of him, the bear starts coming. Boom, John shoots. Boom, I shoot. The bear kind of turns and wheels, crashes off, runs about 30, 40 yards. Silence. I'm like, okay. So we just decided, all right, let's wait for about 30 minutes. And so we walk up there, and we can see where the bear had laid. There was a pretty decent little pool of blood. We start tracking the bear some more, and we're finding more blood. We found more blood than we did before, so we know we hit the bear, obviously. But we go about another 75, maybe 100 yards. And at that point, we still hadn't found the bear. And at that point, we pretty well knew that when we find the bear again, it's not going to be dead, because if we'd have had a mortal shot on it, it would have been dead by now. And there's an old saying, Adventure begins when things go wrong. And at that point, things are definitely going wrong. We could smell the bear the whole entire time. We could smell bear. Basically, as soon as we entered the brush, we could smell bear. And so what we would do is we'd basically duck walk because we had to get below the, the, uh, the foliage, the leaves. So that was about like this. So you had to be about this low. And so John would be taking, watching the blood, and every time he was looking this way, I'd be right behind him or alongside of him looking this way. So we'd always take a couple of steps, and then we'd stop, okay? And everybody thinks, man, that's got to be, tracking a wounded grizzly bear has got to be the ultimate adrenaline rush. And it's actually completely 180 degrees the opposite. It is one of the most peaceful things I've ever done in my life. Because nothing else exists. I'm not a married man. I'm not a father. The only thing in the world, the only, the, the, that is the world. That your world is what is around you, the people that you're with, and a bird that chirps, a squirrel that chirps. You're not listening for a twig to snap. You're listening for a blade of grass to snap. Your senses are never more heightened. And all you're thinking of is killing the bear before it kills you because you're basically, you know it's just a matter of time before that thing charges and you don't know when it's going to happen. So you can't be nervous. You cannot think. To steal a line from Top Gun, a bush pilot, when I asked him about this, he said, you ever heard that, that line from Top, Top Gun? I, I think I got this right. Hopefully I don't butcher this. But he said, if you think, you're dead. You can't think. It's got to be instinctive. That's why it's so critical to be in a situation like that with, with people that have been there before. You don't want somebody that's thinking. Because if they're thinking, if you're thinking in a scenario like that, it's already too late. And so this, we, we go a little bit further, and, and, and John and I, actually, I, uh, I, I, Mitch had his video camera up, and this is no joke. It's like, this is like a Crocodile Dundee movie. I'm quoting movies a lot here. But Mitch has his camera up, and I'm like, hey, Mitch, are you recording this? And he's like, yeah. And I said, open your lens covers. It'll work a little bit better. He literally had his lens covers on. And I'm like, turn the thing on and just hit record. I said, because it's going to happen fast. You know, any time now is going to happen, and when it happens, it's going to happen fast. You're not going to have time to hit record. And it was about a minute later, John's ducked down, and uh, I'm right behind him, and we just sat there for a minute or two, and he just looks back at me and gives a nod, and I give a nod. 
John just kind of reaches around to part the brush, and all of a sudden, or you can just hear this growling, and John just does this, just lays his rifle down. John's shooting a 458 lot, and if you don't know what a 458 lot is, think of like a cannon that would be on an old, on the Spanish Armada or something, and go down about two sizes, and that's a 458 lot. And so John's got two rounds in his rifle, I've got a 375, and I step up beside him, and I can just hear the bear, and it's clearly coming like, I mean, we're so close that I know the bear is coming for John and not me, and we're shoulder to shoulder. And so John's just sitting there waiting, and I figured he's waiting until that thing bites the end of, the, of his barrel, you know. And I can see the brush being mowed down, um, or yeah, just being run over in the front, and then flying up about five, six feet behind it. So I know the bear's in there somewhere, but I can't see it, and it's only from me to this uh, ground blind away. So I've got four rounds in my gun, so I figure, screw it, I'm shooting. So boom, I shoot, boom, 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 boom. And finally the bear, John's out of, out of shells, the bear falls down about right from me to that driftwood away, and I've got one round in my gun. That's the first time we actually saw the bear in the brush uh, as it was charging, and boom, I put one more round in it. So here, we'll see if we can get this, the audio to go here. So in the excitement, that was Mitch's video, so in the excitement, Mitch, Mitch, I don't know, John says he fell down, I don't know if he dropped his camera, but what happened, um, but Mitch is kind of like out of commission, and when the uh, a video camera slaps shut, it quits recording. And so I've got uh, a Go, I had a GoPro on my head, as you can see there, and uh, so I've got, uh, I've got a little bit of it. It's pretty shaky, and it happens pretty darn fast. But then afterwards, uh, Mitch comes up, and uh, he's like, holy smokes, we just got charged by a bear, you know? And he's like, he's getting his camera going and he's kind of looking and he's pretty excited. He's like, okay, is this thing on? I'm like, yeah, I think it's on. He's like, okay. So he pulls his camera up and he's like, all right, you guys, I want you guys to hold your hands out for me in front of the camera. So John and I held our hands out side by side and he's like, oh my gosh, I don't know whether to be comforted or even more scared by the fact that your guys' hands aren't shaking at all. He just couldn't believe that we weren't, we weren't just panicking. But uh, after the fact, um, I assure you, we were shaking a little bit, or at least I was. John 15, chapter 15, verse 13 says, There's no greater love than this, to lay w w down one's life for his friends. As we packed that bear out, I packed it out at least, so I didn't make John do that. Got it back to camp, and we were just laying there at night, you know, and, and John and I were just kind of, gabbing about whatever, and you know, then I thought about my wife and my kids, and I just thought, that's a pretty, uh, how, how would you put it? That's pretty darn, I don't know, there's, there's got to be a better word, I'm a writer, so I should be able to come up with a better word than this, but, I mean, what, what, more, how, how, what more could a guy like that do? for another human being, risk his own life. And he, and he didn't, I don't, I, I don't even really, I, I know he didn't do it for me. He did it for people that he'd never met before. He knew that somewhere was a woman that loved this man and two, three daughters that loved this man as well. And he was willing to lay his life down for them. And that's pretty powerful. And, and I was just talking to somebody here tonight. You know, you go through life and the world, the world will tell you to seek all the things that you want out of life. Entertain yourself. We're in a culture that is entertaining itself to death. So little is real in this world. And what I love about the Alaskan wilderness is you get into real situations. Every, time, every hunting trip that I'm on, we encounter something that I've never encountered before. And guess what? There's nobody there to bail you out. You and the people you're with got to figure out how to get yourselves out of it. And when you do that, that bond that you form, that's glue, that's cement. Nothing will break that. And those are some of the greatest experiences that you'll ever have. The, mountain, the, the views from the mountaintops are pretty sweet, but the reason why they're so good is because of the valleys that you had to cross to get there. 
And what I love about Alaska is being totally immersed in the wilderness. And the lifestyle and the perspective. And being in nature, life makes so much more sense to me. And I've been studying it for, well, about 35 years now, and I feel that it's the language that I best understand. And I've always said, when that airplane drops you off and flies away, everything changes. I once heard a story of a guy that I know, Hunter got dropped off in the Alaska Peninsula to hunt brown bears. The airplane was still in sight, and he, and he just told his guide, call that plane back. And he's like, I, I can't. And he's like, call that plane back, I want out of here. Like he knew that he did not want to be there. I mean, so he spent tens of thousands of dollars to come brown bear hunting, but when he was actually out there doing it and that airplane was leaving him, he knew he didn't want to be there. And the guy stayed awake all night. According to the guide, he, was, he literally broke down and cried. And then the airplane couldn't come and get him to the next morning because he just knew that he did not want to be there. And it gets real. I mean, I'm here to tell you, I've felt lonely many, many times. And I've had some pretty honest conversations with myself. But what I say is when you're out there and there's no man-made distraction, all the things that you think that are important in life, it funnels down and it gets very, very narrow. And pretty soon you realize that the things that are really valuable in life, it's almost as if you could place them on the head of a pin. There's very, very few things that really matter. And so I would say most of, I, I like... I don't know if I have ADD or dyslexia or what, but like I, don't, I learn things in a very weird fashion. And usually I've got to learn things the hard way, and I've usually got to learn it by, by doing it. And, and so most of my most poignant lessons in life um, have come while I'm in the wilderness. So I'm going to share a story here. This is, uh, I mean, this is the most personal story that run away. I wrote a chapter about this in my book. It's called Seven Nights in a Six Pack. The outfitter drops me off. He was kind of a renegade outfitter. Uh, I, think he, I think he might have done a little time not long after this hunt, but he drops me off, in prison that is. Um, he drops me off and I've got no communication. I've just got a little bit of food. He says, I'm gonna bring you a hunter in two days. And uh, I thought, okay. And so all throughout this time, I'm pacing up and down this gravel bar. It's about 200 yards long, and I basically had a trench in the gravel bar, and I'm just praying for some direction. I'm just like, God, if you're real, I need you to show up. I need you to give me something to go off of here because I just don't see that life is worth living. And during this time, this cow moose and her yearling calf would cross the river right by my camp. There was kind of a shallow area in the river. And the first time or two, they were kind of scared of me. They could smell my camp. Eventually, they just kind of ignored me. Well, the outfitter doesn't show up for five days. And when he does, I'm thinking, okay, I've got a hunter. He doesn't have a hunter. All he steps out of the plane, he's got a, a package of pork chops and a six-pack of beer. And he says, sorry, you know, I took your hunter to somebody else, but I will have another hunter in here for, you, for two days, in two days. I thought, okay, that's fine. So he flies off, I go back to my camp, and I got nothing but time, I crack open a beer, I grab a pork chop, and I just I got a little backpacker stove, so I just started frying a pork chop. And as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, this moose, cow and her yearling, come walking out, they go across the river, the cow goes across, she's nibbling on some willow buds, and the calf is right midstream, and that cow turns and looks, and looks to check on the welfare of her yearling calf. And right then, it was a light switch moment. Two years of depression vanished right then and there because I was delivered a message through the language that I best understand, which is nature. Because I recognize nature is black and white. There's no gray area in nature. Any day now, when, when the timing is right, that cow will abandon that yearling because she was fat and swollen. She was going to have another calf. And when her instinct tells her that you no longer have the energy to use on this yearling, you need to focus on your new calf. She is going to push that yearling away and never have anything to do with it. So any day now, that yearling is going to have to fend, a her, fend for herself from wolverines, wolves, bears, 
And whatever happens to that yearling, there will be no one there to feel sorry for it. And it'll never feel sorry for itself the way that I was. And here's the thing with nature. Nothing in nature, or let me put it this way, everything in nature strives to maximize its potential until the day that it dies, without fail. But that's not the case with us humans. And I recognize in that moment that, Billy, you do have a choice. You can either end it or get on with life. And literally, that my depression was gone. And I didn't, I didn't really connect the dots, but I think I had surrendered enough. I had, I had gotten rid of myself enough. Do I believe God answered my prayers? Absolutely. Do I believe God put that cow and that yearling there for me? I don't think that at all. I think that I was still enough to recognize all the things that go around us every day and paid attention enough to witness that, to witness how life actually works. And so at that point, I just accepted maybe I never will find anyone. Um, you know, maybe I'll be single my whole life. And, <laughs> and what I found when you surrender and, and you kind of go into an attitude with, I don't care what the costs are, I'm going to do this anyways, that's when life really opens up for you. And a year later, I met this amazing woman who uh, has always supported me in everything that I do. And six years after we were married, we had this little bundle of joy. Her name is Charlie. And she was born in July. I went off guiding for a few months. And then a few months after that, I come home. And um, I'm home for the winter. And eventually, my wife comes up to me and she says, well, guess what, Daddy? And she never called me Daddy. And so I thought that was odd. She goes, I'm pregnant. Let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June. So you're due like in August? And she goes, yeah, that's probably about right. I said, well, that's not going to work. That's sheep season. And so now we had this. She's due on uh, August 17th. And I'm like, how... Uh, how are we going to do this? You know, do I stay home, you know, for, for the season or do I stay home for the birth and then go up? And we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this. So uh, sheep season opens August 10th. And so finally I told my wife, I think she was due August 12th. That's what it was. And, uh, and so I said, well, I, I think I'll skip the first hunt. And then after the baby's born, I'll go up for the second hunt. And so my wife says, you know, I've been thinking about it too. Why don't you just go to Alaska, Amy, my sister-in-law, she'll be there with me for the birth. You know, I've done this before, it shouldn't be any big deal. And uh, you just go on up because I think if you're here for the birth, it's just going to be that much harder for you to leave. And I hadn't been, I hadn't, I'd been married long enough to where I knew this sounded too good to be true. This was probably a trap. And I'm like, are you serious? She's like, yeah, yeah, that'll, I think it'll be fine. So off I go to Alaska. I go up there hunting. And here's where I'm at. And so my first hunter, he tagged out, and he left. And it was August 17th, so the baby kind of came a little bit late. And I am, um, I'm there by myself, and there's 35 lambs and ewes up on this mountain. So dull sheep right up here. And on the other side of the valley is a grizzly sow with her two cubs. And so I'm just sitting there, you know, nothing really to do. I would check in with a satellite phone. I'd have to turn it off so they can't call me because I only had so much battery. And uh, I would call in about every half hour. And so my sister-in-law was filling me in. You know, it's three centimeters, four centimeters. They got their own scoring system for that, um, telling me what's going on. And, and then all of a sudden, nobody answers the phone. And nobody answered the phone for a couple hours. And I'd said a few prayers that morning and kind of throughout the day. But during those two hours, I started walking the gravel bar and I started praying. And the more I walked, the more I prayed, the more anxious I became. And there I am, walking back and forth, looking up at the mountains, looking around me and feeling pretty darn small feeling like a deadbeat dad who's 3,000 miles away from his wife and his unborn child. And I'm praying to God for the safety of my wife and my unborn child when 10, 15 years earlier, I'd spit right in God's face. And all of a sudden, I realize that if the God of this world is a God of vengeance, I was ripe. 
God wanted to get even with me, what better way than to get even with me that day? And I'm here to tell you that the bottom dropped out of my, my guts, my soul, my heart, my everything. And I felt pretty worthless. I felt pretty small. And I didn't figure, I didn't grow up in the, I went to church. I won't say I grew up in the church. I went to Sunday school and stuff. Everything seemed like a fairy tale to me. I always imagined with Goliath with one eyeball, like it was something you'd see in a cartoon. When I heard about the Holy Ghost, I was always looking for a basketball with a sheet hung over it and tied together at the bottom, hanging from the rafters in the corner of the church. It all, it all seemed like a fallacy. I couldn't touch it, I couldn't see it, and it never did anything for me. And I, at that moment, I just, I, I was nothing. I was in a moment of nothingness. And I just got down on my knees and I told myself, Billy, if, if you're, if you're going to ask God for anything, you better make it count. And I don't even think that I thought of the words. And I've noticed when God works in my life, it's when I come to a point of complete surrender. And I just got down on my knees and the words just came out of my mouth. I just said, God, I don't have any right to ask you for any favors, but if anything bad, anything at all, has to happen today, I would rather you strike me dead right here and now than for anything to happen to my wife and my unborn child. And I meant it from the bottom of my heart. And the tears were falling out of my eyes when I got up. And I looked at that mountain, I looked at those lambs and ewes, and all of a sudden, John 3.16 came into my mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I always wondered, why did Jesus have to come to this earth? And I realized right then that I was seeing the holy gospel through nature. Because there is no animal alive that wouldn't fight to its death to protect its offspring. Because that's the only way that nature perpetuates. And I recognize as a father, there's no greater way for God to prove his love for mankind than to send his son, his offspring to earth to die for us. And right then and there, the gospel of Jesus Christ, I mean, I'd heard it all my life about him being raised on a cross and dying and descending and raising again on the third day for me. That didn't make any sense. But through the lens of nature, it made perfect sense to me right then. And then next, and this is just, I mean, this is all happening very, very fast. Because I was, at that point, I was consumed with peace. And I remember our pastor always said this in his service, Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the only way to describe how I felt. It was peace beyond all understanding. I realized in that moment that I'd never experienced peace in my whole entire life. And I knew, I knew that I knew that it was the Holy Spirit. How do I know it was the Holy Spirit? Because I've, I felt like a grain of sand on an endless beach, but at the same time, I've never felt more powerful in my whole entire life. I didn't know if my wife would die, my unborn child would die, but I knew that it was in God's hands and I was in God's hands. And I remember the uh, story of, of Jesus and Nicodemus. He said, a man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. And that's the only way to describe how I felt is I knew that I was born again. I knew that I was a different creature moving forward. And as soon as that thought came into my mind, I heard God's still voice, you have to tell others. That was it. And in that moment, I, want, I, I knew I would. I knew that I would. That was 10 years ago now. And during that time, I have. But there's been plenty of times where I've sandbagged on God. I haven't always followed him the way that he'd want me to. And I, I never imagined in a million years that this is, this is where this would take me. So the deal was, um, if we had a boy, we were going to name him Brooks Range Moles. 
because that's where his deadbeat dad would have been when, uh, when he was born, but my wife got to pick the name for a girl, and so we ended up having a little baby girl. Her name is Francesca. We call her Frankie. So here is our, the Moles family. My wife, my stepdaughter, Matea, Charlie, and that's little Frankie. When I was a kid, it was my dream to either be a hunting guide, an outdoor writer, or a video producer. Things have just happened in my life that today I'm all three. And then eventually I got asked to do some speaking. I speak at corporate functions, sports shows, um, all kinds of things. Um, and then one day I got asked to share my faith at a prayer breakfast in Reno, Nevada. There's a group of sheep hunters there, and there was an awards program. Um, I went on to like 2 o'clock in the morning, and this started at like 6.30 in the morning. I had never spoke to a crowd in the morning before, and I mean, to be honest, most of the people were hungover. And so they're all walking in, you know, with their cups of coffee, and they're just staring at me, and I was the guy that made them get up in the morning. And I gave this presentation, and it was flat. There was no energy in the room. It was, it just, I mean, nobody laughed at anything. It was tough. And I was tearing down my stuff after it was all over, and I just, I wanted to crawl in a hole and die. I thought I was ready to share those stories. I don't, I don't even remember if I shared this one. I don't even remember. I'm guessing I probably did. But, like, I was so nervous, and these people are, like, I mean, the night before, I just saw them all in tuxedos and stuff, and I'm just a farm kid, you know. That was all, I mean, these are, like, multimillionaires, and I've been around some really rich people, and now that doesn't impress me in the least, but at the time, it did a little bit. And, uh, yeah, grizzly bears don't scare me, but people do. <laughs> that was crazy. And I, it just, like, I was like, man, what am I doing? This, this, this I, I'm not cut out for this. And this guy, he's about 60 years old, there's an open aisle in the middle, and he starts walking towards me, and as I'm putting my stuff away, I'm like, oh man, I hope he's not coming to talk to me. And as he gets closer, I can see tears coming out of his eyes. And I'm like, dude, it couldn't have been that bad, you know? And he comes up to me, and he just puts his hand out, and he just says, Billy, I'm going through the toughest time in my life right now, and I just can't tell you how much your words meant to me today. And that was like God just hit me in the heart with a sledgehammer. That was better than any 10-foot bear, any 70-inch moose, any 40-inch ram that I've, actually I've never guided for any 40-inch rams, but that was better than any, anything that I've ever done in my whole entire life. To impact another human being's life like that, in that moment, I recognize that exactly right there. That's why God called me to the wilderness ever since I was a little kid, is to share it. And that was the one command that he gave me was to share this. And I was embarrassed because of me, you know. And, 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 and our world is all about us, you know. And we're, our pride, our own ego, we make everything about us. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is everything but being about yourself. The devil wants it to be about yourself because he knows as long as you're worried about yourself, you're not doing anything for anybody else and that's exactly where he wants you. He wants you to have a bunch of anxiety. He wants you to be staring at Facebook wondering why you're not taking your family on a vacation like John over here. He's wondering why you're not as pretty as Sally over there. That's exactly where he wants us to be. He wants us worried about ourselves because then we're worthless for everybody else. So there's an old saying, I don't remember who said it, oh, I'm kind of a couple steps behind, I apologize. There's an old uh, adage, I don't even know who said it, maybe Leo Aldepold, uh, uh, everybody's heard it, the strong survive. I don't believe that's true. What survives in nature and who survives is the most efficient. Efficiency. That's, that's, that's how things get done. I've been guiding 24 years. I'm not as strong as I used to be, but I'm a way better guide than I was when I was 24 years old because I've got experience. I've been through some things. I've tried some things, and I've failed. I've failed a lot, and I've learned from those mistakes. And what I think a lot of us think that God doesn't want me, look at all the things that I've done. 
all those things that you've done, that's why God needs you. That's why He needs us, because someone's going to come along in our path that we're able to minister. All those mistakes that I've made as a guide, that's what makes me valuable to my clients. I just had a hunter gave me a $7,000 tip, guided him for four days. Because as he said, he was a 60-year-old fat guy, and I could get him a big bear. Because I knew when to go, when to stay put. He said, I thanked him, and I said, thank you for that tip, because that's, that's the biggest tip I've ever got. I said, I thank you for me and my family. And he said, you know, I recognize that it's your skill and your experience that gave me the confidence to do this hunt. You make a tough hunt like this easy on an old fat guy like me because of my experience, and I was rewarded for it. And, I, and as I was telling Kelvin, I'm not a, a believer in the prosperity gospel, but I believe that that's, that's, that's how it works. That's what makes us valuable is, is, is the things that we know, the things that we've been through. Proverbs, one of my favorite verses, trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek to do his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. That's where when we're wrestling with God and we think we know the way to go, and I, I don't think that this process ever stops. We get confident. We, we do a few things right, and we think we know which, which is the way to go. There's no more efficient guide than Jesus. He knows exactly where we're to go. All we have to do is follow him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's the deal that I learned about reading the Bible that I never heard a pastor say, or, or one of the many things that I learned after I really started reading the Bible that I never heard in church. Jesus is either a lunatic, or he is who he says he is. And he says he's the Son of God. He says that nobody comes to the Father except through him. And so I realized as I was reading the New Testament, somebody gave me at a sports show, they gave me a copy of these, and I got a whole bunch of them in the back. If anybody wants them, they're free. But it changed my life. And I realized I had to make a decision. I either accept him or deny him. And I realized that Jesus came to this earth as a man to be our guide so that we waste as little time going in the wrong direction, seeking the wrong things. Because we won't be of any value on this earth as long as we're doing that. And he put us here on this earth to experience joy, fulfillment, and most importantly, his love. So just as God created everything in nature for a purpose, he created each and every one of us for a purpose. And purpose is kind of like a buzzword that I'm a little bit like almost leery of using it, but um, I guess I haven't come up with a better way to put it. So Genesis, the very first chapter of the Bible says, so God created man in his own image. So if you think about that, every one of us in here is created in God's image. And yet we're all different. So what does that say? It tells me that there's a tiny speck of God in each and every one of us. Our purpose, I believe, is to cast that speck out into the world. Because if we don't, there's nobody else who can do it. And just like everything else in nature, you have something to give. And the only way that we discover what that is, is that we have to accept salvation through Jesus Christ. We have to accept the fact that whatever shame, guilt, whatever it is that's, that we're holding on to for ourselves, that's robbing us of God's design, of being free to love others instead of ourselves. As long as we're looking inward, we're never going to live the life we were created to live. And Jesus said you can sum up the law of the prophets, you can sum up the Bible in these two commandments. Love God above all things and love your neighbor as yourself. And what does the world tell us? 
the world wants us to think about nothing but ourselves. And I just think that it's so when you look at this counterculture, you know, and you read the Bible, and you see so many things that are going on in our society and our governments and whatever else, it's, it's basically everything's against what Jesus would have us do. And when you find God's path, and when I've, been, when I've known that the, the greatest joy and fulfillment in my life is when I know that I'm in unison, that, mean, that I'm in communion with God, that's the purest and the greatest joy that there is on earth. And, and finding that gift, finding what you have to give, that's better than anything you can ever attain for yourself. All the dreams that I ever had as a kid, I fulfilled them. The last one was I hunted buffalo, uh, Cape Buffalo in Africa, because one of my hunters who I guided many times, he knew that it was my dream. And so he paid for me to go to Cape, uh, go Cape Buffalo hunting with him. It was like probably $40,000 out of his pocket to take me Cape Buffalo hunting. And when I was in the back of that rig, driving back to camp that night, I realized, so I was like 38 years old, every dream that I'd ever had, I'd attained. 38 years, and you know what it was? It was, the, it was one of the biggest letdowns I've ever had in my life. I, I mean, I've hunted New Zealand, I've hunted in Azerbaijan, I've hunted in Africa a couple, a couple of times, I've hunted in Alaska for 24 years. I mean, that's like the World Series of big game hunting. I've been there and I've done that. And I was almost saddened by the fact that I'd spent 38 years chasing that. I'm glad that I realized those dreams because I probably would have never came to that revelation. But I recognize that, Billy, you've wasted half your life for you. And I believe that God ordained it somehow. He brought Barry and I together, and I believe that's probably why God, he felt led to take me on that hunt, because it was, it was a light switch for me. I just realized, you don't know how many days you've got left that you can give to others, because I know that there's nothing, that Cape Buffalo, that was not as good for me as that guy coming up crying, shaking my hand. It just wasn't as good. There's just no doubt about it. The sheep hunt is the hardest hunt that I guide, and it's invariable that, you know, well, let me backtrack here. So a sheep hunt, sometimes we're going to be hiking 100 miles in 10 days. You're up and down mountains carrying heavy packs, you're eating, you know, very limited amounts of food, and it, it never fails that when you start the hunt, and I tell the hunter what he needs to bring, I always see him stuffing a few extra things in his pack that he thinks he needs. And then we go off and hunt for maybe, let's say, three, four, five days, and then we come back to our base camp where the airplane dropped us off, and the hunter, it's invariable, he's like, you're right, I didn't need this, I didn't need this, I didn't need this, and he throws all the junk out of his pack that he doesn't need, right? And so then we go back at it again. And then about day five or six, and this is on the best sheep hunts. If you, if you watch any of my videos on YouTube, watch Spirit of a Sheep Hunter. And this is exactly what happened. About day five or six, the hunter will collapse. And this, the, this guy that I made this video about, he was uh, in the Marines. And he said, this makes boot camp look like a walk in the park. He said, he goes, I got nothing left. And I said, Mike, you've, you've got to keep going. And there's kind of a long story behind this, but this is kind of your classic sheep hunt in that you, we, you know, the, as a hunter, you come in, you know, you want, I mean, that's a really nice ram right there, probably 36 inches. And, you know, that's what you want is you want these flared tips like this. Some hunters, they want the tips. Some hunters, they want the horns to be broken. A lot of sheep bro break their horns. But these hunters come in and they have all these ideas of what they want. You know, they want to get a 40 inch curl. But by about day five, they dream of this hunt for two years, and by about day five, they just want to quit. They just want to go home, get some ice packs, take him some ibuprofen, and they want to quit. But it's my job to get them to keep going. It's my job to give them some more food, some more water, pump them up a little bit, and, and, and basically inspire them not to quit. And what happens is you've got to get the hunter to go all in. And I'll tell the hunter this, and this is what usually gets them, as I tell them, 
that airplane's going to come pick us up after 10 days. And what I tell them is, when you get into that airplane, and as soon as that air, those tires leave the tundra, it's over. Right now, and, and at that moment, if you're that hunter, getting a 40-inch ram, getting perfect, you know, flared lamb tips or broken horns or whatever his goals were for the last two years, and those five or six days that he was actually hunting, those mean nothing anymore. All that matters is that when he gets, off the, gets onto the plane and he leaves the tundra, that he has no regrets. Because once you take off, there's no coming back. And those are the best sheep hunts when that happens. And when you go in, when you go all in, it's like a metamorphosis. You change. You become a new creature. And on day two or three, when you would look at that mountain and you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, we're going to climb that? By about day six or seven, you don't even look at the tops of those mountains. You just look one step ahead. One step ahead. And as a guide, that's what all you want your hunter to do. You don't worry about what's happening next. Nothing drives me more crazy than the hunter that says, well, after we climb that mountain, what are we going to do? Well, I don't know. Let's go shoot something. Let's go up that mountain. Maybe we'll shoot something. You can only plan so far ahead. And from there, you, it's just got to be instinctive. You can't plan out a whole entire 10-day hunt. And so as a guide, I want my hunter just to put one foot in front of the other, and I don't want him to argue with me. I mean, we can make decisions together, but at the end of the day, if you're not going to listen to me, what did you hire me for? That's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. He just wants us to follow him one step at a time. Are we going to trust him or not? And it's funny, when you're not seeing anything, and everything's tough, and when it gets so tough that we surrender because we realize that we're lost, that's when the hunters will always listen to the guide. They're just looking at you because they want you to just tell them anything, give them some sort of hope, right? And that's what Jesus is. He's our hope. No matter how bad it gets, if we follow him one step at a time, he will lead us out of whatever we're in. We don't want to spend our lives following the wrong guide. Sex, money, insecurity, fear, addiction. Those are just a few examples. Those are going to lead to nothing but hardship. And, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And I've, I've done it enough in my life that <laughs> uh, I mean, we've all been there. I've learned that. And when you feel that separation from God, you know you're going in the wrong direction. And, and there's times, and there might be some of us here tonight that, that know Christ, but we're carrying a whole bunch of junk in our pack that we know that's not serving us. But we won't let it go. If that's you, Jesus wants to take you on a final stock. It's time to throw everything out. And maybe it's time to throw the pack aside and you bring nothing but the rifle. And I don't think that ever ends. I think, I think we're all, I mean, even as a guide, I'm always fine-tuning. I'm always shaving off an ounce here or there, trying to be as efficient as I can possibly be. And here's the thing about Jesus. He wants to be our guide, and he's willing to give us the sheep hunt. When he died on, our, on the cross, he paid for our sheep hunt. All we have to do is accept it, fly into camp, Lace up the boots really, really tight because I'm here to tell you that he's going to take you through some valleys because when he takes you through some valleys, you're going to meet people along that trail. And it's what he takes you through in the valley, that's your ministry. That's your church. That's what you're going to share with somebody else who's lost, who's headed the wrong, wrong direction. And as you're going past them, you're going to be able to point them in the right direction. No, I've been there. You don't want to go there. And so tonight, I want to give you guys, everyone here, the opportunity to go all in and follow Jesus Christ as their guide. 
And that all-in moment, as you follow Christ and you accept him into your life, that's called salvation. Salvation occurs when we wholeheartedly repent of our sins and turn away from them. That's one thing that I never really learned in church. I just learned that, you know, whoever believes and baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will condemned, be condemned. So I always figure, well, I believe, I'm good. That's only one verse of a pretty thick Bible. Paul says that we become a, before we're baptized, we're, that's our old man. When we become baptized, when we're believers, we become new men. That's our old life, and we begin a new life. And the third, second step, we have to confess Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And third, we're baptized in Jesus' name and in the Holy Spirit. And after that, it's just simply follow the guide. Follow Jesus, trust and obey until the airplane comes and pick us, picks us up. And all that's necessary to get started is an ounce of faith, a speck of faith. The Bible says, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it will move. What he's saying is that nothing will be impossible for you. So in a minute, I'm going to offer a prayer of salvation. And for someone in this room, and it might be me, someone in this room, the airplane's going to come and pick us all up. Somebody in this room is going to be first of us. And when we're, whether we're young or old, we don't know. Because the weather changes. <laughs> Just like in the wilderness of Alaska. The pilot has a plan, but if the storms are moving over there, he might come over and pick somebody up that he wasn't supposed to pick up to the next day. We just don't know. So I have every confidence that God brought me here for someone tonight. And so maybe if, if you are a Christian and you feel that, that you know, your pack's just so overloaded and, and you know that there's something, because <laughs> I've been there, you know, there's something that you're holding on to that for whatever reason you just don't want to kick it, you don't want to throw it out, and you're ready for it, tonight's the night to toss it into the fire, you can say this prayer with me as well. So if you would, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die on the cross as payment for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead and sits with you on your heavenly throne where one day we will meet and all will be judged. Right now, Lord, I feel lost and overburdened. I repent before you. I ask you for, to forgive me of my sins. Lord, I need you. I need you, Jesus, to be my guide. I'm done with my old way of living. Lead me in this life. Give me the strength to follow you. Transform me into a new person, the person you created me to be. By faith, I invite your Holy Spirit into me the best way I know how. And I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Strengthen me and guide me that I may discover the life you created me to live, that I may bless others and spend eternity with you in heaven. Romans 10 says that if we confess, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For it is with our heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So if you're sitting here tonight and you accept and agree with this prayer, right now is your opportunity to secure your life with Jesus as your guide and your eternal destiny with him in heaven. And you can do it by simply raising your hand and saying, Jesus is Lord. For some of you here tonight, this is the most pivotal moment in your life. So don't let it slip away. Jesus is Lord, and raise your hand. 
And I suspect right now someone is wrestling with God over this decision. So if you're already a Christ follower and you feel led to recommit your life to Jesus, I ask you to do so boldly to encourage your neighbor by raising your hand and declaring, Jesus is Lord. Second Timothy tells us that God did not give us a spirit of timidity and fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And if you're feeling fear right now, the great deceiver, he is all about fear. That might be a voice that you've been listening to for too long. And if you're ready to shut that up and follow Christ, raise your hand and Jesus is Lord because there's only one judgment that matters. And Lord, I thank you this night for hearing our prayer. I thank you for all the hands that we're a part of this event. And I thank you for our safety, and I ask for continued safety on everyone's way home here this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And before I go, I just want to say one thing. That uh, baptism, I, I, believe, uh, I, I, don't, I believe it's pretty clear-cut that you have to be baptized as well. So you're... I, I'm, I would get baptized in, in the name of Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. And I've, I've been a lot of places. I've done everything that I've wanted to do. But I'm here to tell you that when Christ is your Savior and you actually, you're truly doing your best to follow Him, it's the greatest adventure of your life. He's going to lead you places that you had never imagined that you would go. And I know He's going to lead you places that you would never go on your own. But there's going to be valleys, there's going to be rocks, and it's not going to be easy. But when you, when you struggle through the valley, and you reach those mountaintops, and when God works in your life, and when you need Him, and you surrender to Him, and He's there for you, there's nothing else. Paul said, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. And that's, that's honestly what it took to me to be absolutely miserable in everything I did until I followed Him. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Billy, for that powerful message. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see how God works in someone's life and through their circumstances, through their valleys, through their career. It's amazing to see that. God can do anything, and he can speak to you in any way he chooses. And uh, it's amazing. And I hope and pray tonight that everyone that walks out of this building can say that I am a child of God, that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and faith and Savior. I've confessed it with my mouth. I've followed that with an act of, of baptism, act of obedience and baptism. It's about relationship. And so, as Billy has pointed out, sometimes we say, I believe, but what does that really mean? The act of obedience in displaying that is what is important. That relationship builds and grows. And I hope that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ tonight. I um, am so blessed to have you all here tonight and have, had, had, have Billy here tonight to share. Our church hears the gospel on a regular basis. They do. But I'll also say that sometimes we need to hear it from a different perspective. And tonight, it's been brought from a different perspective. And it resonates with us where we are. And I appreciate that. And uh, my prayer, I'm going to pray in a minute, and I'm going to pray that all of you are where you need to be in your relationship. And if you're not, my prayer is going to be that God will guide you to where you need to be in that relationship. And I think, you know, I get up here and I think, well, we didn't have the crowd I expected. That's okay. If one person's life changes as a result of this and it's worth every penny that it costs and it's worth every bit of effort that went into it. And so I hope and pray that your life has not only been impacted but changed by this event tonight. After I pray, then we're going to have Melissa Grogan come up and we're going to draw for the grand prizes and we'll go from that point. So please pray with me. Lord God, I'm so thankful. So thankful for the message of salvation that was brought tonight and how it was related to Billy's career, 
how we go through valleys, and it is then that we gain a testimony. It is there where we learn to trust. It is there where we learn what faith is really about. It is there where our words of confession turn to displays of relationship and faith and trust. And I pray tonight, Father, that every person that walks out of this building will do so with the assurance and confidence that Jesus is Lord. To your name we pray in the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name.